Good evening. Uh, my name is Laura Kriefman. I'm the CEO at the Barbican Theatre in Plymouth, and I'm really pleased to welcome you here for this evening's uh, masterclass with the fantastic John Aitken. These masterclasses on Thursday nights run, uh, we try to do about 10 every term, um, and we've got an amazing array of people um, coming to speak to us over the um, first five weeks, including filmmakers, uh, people talking about extraordinary groundbreaking arts organisations, um, John here tonight, people from the music industry. So do keep an eye on our website and do sign up for the, uh, and on our socials and sign up for the next sets of these webinars, um, which we run as part of Rebels, which is our talent development work. Um, I'm really pleased to be that we're starting after Christmas um, with uh, John Aiken. I have known John and his work for a, quite a few years now. Um, John is a brilliant freelance filmmaker and photographer based in Bristol. And he has been uh, working across journalism and marketing and has spent over kind of six years or so creating content for arts organisations and businesses and has made projects for uh, documenting projects in uh, South Korea and Japan and uh, I have always loved his attitude to work and his approach to how he thinks about it and um, and also his approach to his sense of his value and uh, and uh, uh, we've always had really great conversations about how you approach uh, creating financial stability for yourself as a um, creative individual so I thought it was an absolute brilliant person to get to come in and talk to you guys about this idea of like how do you value yourself what's your own creative worth and also right now what tools and tricks you can use um, to make that much easier for yourself as the January 31st deadline that most self-employed people hate uh, rears its head again so um uh, in a second, I'm going to hand over to uh, John, who's going to give you a presentation about his work and talk through some of these elements. And then we're going to have a Q&A um, uh, after about 40 minutes or so. If you have any questions or um, things you would like to pick up on or expand on, please use the chat function and the uh, Q&A function. And when we open up into conversation, I'll try and make sure all of those are heard and brought to the table. Um, that's probably enough from me at the moment. But without further ado, I'm really pleased to welcome John. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> what an introduction. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm really, really happy to be here to meet you all. Um, I'm, I'm here to talk about the uh, potentially quite intimidating world of freelancing. And um, I'm going to try and give you the presentation that I wish that I'd heard when I started about six years ago. I'm going to do that and I'm going to do it in three parts. So the first part is that, yeah, I've been uh, self-employed for about six years now, and I'm going to take you through my career journey through that time. Uh, the second part, we're going to talk about what it actually means to be a freelancer and all of the, uh, I'll be honest, quite really boring, potentially quite scary, but really important stuff that you need to know. We're going to go over the basics of that. And then the third part, we're going to talk about worth and we're going to talk about money and we're going to be really open because uh, I think that's really valuable. Uh, but just before I start, I just want to give a quick visual description of myself, just in case anybody is out there with a visual impairment or you're listening rather than watching. So I am a 30 year old white cis male. I've got brown curly hair. I've got a dark jumper and I'm in a beige bedroom with lots of test paints sploshes behind me. Um, I'm, I'm also very aware that all of you are probably at very different points in your freelance journey. You may not have started yet. You may you, maybe a few years down the line. I don't know that. As Laura said, if you've got any questions, please pop them in the Q&A box and we'll go through those afterwards. Uh, but do remember that this has been recorded so you can watch it back. Uh, if you are in the future watching this back, then I just want to please say, um, research the things that I talk about because the government likes to change things year, uh, year by year. Uh, and so things might go out of date a little bit quickly. Uh, so just be aware of that. And a final caveat is that I am uh, not an accountant. Uh, I Everything I'm gonna talk about is just based on experience because as Laura said, I'm a filmmaker and a photographer. Right, let's start the presentation. I'm just gonna share my screen. Give me one second. There we go. Okay. So, how did I get here as a filmmaker and a photographer? So, between 2007 and 2013, I was doing my A-levels and my art degree, 
And throughout that time, I had part-time work in supermarkets. So I started at co-op on the checkouts, and then I moved to Sainsbury's to the shelf, uh, shelf stacking. Uh, so kind of a big, illustrious career in supermarkets. Um, and during the end of my degree, while I was doing this part-time, I started making YouTube videos. And so this was something that I just decided to do on a whim. Uh, this is my old channel. All of it's privated now because it's very cringy to look back on and I don't want anyone seeing it. Uh, but by doing this, it taught me basic video skills, uh, how to shoot, how to edit. And it also taught me about YouTube and the general online landscape at that point. And I realized that I really, really enjoyed it. So I carried on doing it as kind of like a side project for the next few years. And it was a combination of that and then uh, looking around in Bristol where I was based for a job, I got a six month internship at a place called Rife Magazine. Uh, Rife Magazine is a platform in Bristol uh, for, uh, made entirely by under 24s for other under 24s. Uh, so it's kind of uh, young people making the content that other young people want to actually be engaging with. And it was great. I spent six months making uh, videos, uh, long form articles. Um, I made uh, a piece about where to go and get free condoms for in Bristol, which that gift is from at the bottom. And I got to go to Pride and meet the leather daddies of Pride. Uh, and it was a really great experience. And that was kind of my uh, introduction to the creative industries. And it also gave me something really important. And that was the knowledge that I know how to do things that other people don't. And this is something that all of you know how to do as well. Like we've all got something that we are kind of, don't even think about doing because we know how to do it so well. It's kind of innate. It's part of how we do things. And for me, it was just understanding social media, it's understanding YouTube. Uh, and I was taught uh, that other people would like to pay me for that knowledge. Um, and so the next job I got, was for a startup company, a tiny little company based in Bristol called Daredevil Project. And together we were making a phone app. And I was there to run their social media and basically be their token young person uh, because the product that we were creating was for young people and they needed someone in that target audience to be part of the team. So I was there, I helped in the kind of the creative direction of the product and also did all the kind of communications for them. Alongside this, I started to freelance. So People were asking me to make short form uh, video content um, and I was also running workshops with young people, basically teaching them how to make their first ever YouTube videos. And I was doing this in my weekends and in my evenings because this job with this startup was full time. So I would do this all day, five days a week. And in my evenings, I would start to do little bits of freelance work. About a year later, the kind of direction of this business changed and I decided that I wanted to do something different. So I quit and I managed to get another job at a place called Watershed, which is in Bristol. And if you visited Bristol, you may have been there before. Uh, Watershed is a kind of a cultural arts organization. It's got an art house cinema, uh, a cafe, and it's got event spaces. And it's also got a studio there, which is where I met Laura. Um, and I joined them in their marketing department as their first ever content creator. So I was uh, doing things that I've similar to before. I was making videos. Um, I was documenting events like this is one of my photos from Drag Queen Storytime, which was like my favorite event of the entire year. Um, we also promoted films. So we had a film about a sausage dog. So we were like, let's get a sausage dog. And luckily one of the team had one. So this was uh, Martha, who we brought in to have a little tour around the building. And this became part of a social media campaign. And then I also created things like this video, which is now shown on the big screen before every feature film shown in the cinema there, which basically tells people um, the kind of behavior that the organization would really like them to, to, to do during the film screening, which is basically shut up, don't look at your phone, be respectful. But obviously we did it in a much nicer way than that. Um, but also I was really proud of this piece because we made it quite, uh, we made it as inclusive as we could. And so we've got David Ellington there who was doing the uh, British Sign Language throughout and we made him part of the film. And that was a really fun thing. Um, and I continued doing my freelancing during this as well. So this was my part-time job. I was doing this three days a week and then the other two days a week were for freelance projects. Um, and I was going towards more video production at this point and photography. Uh, so I was kind of changing a little bit and I was doing more and more of it. And this was growing. Um, 
month by month, I was getting more freelance work and to the point where it was actually taking up, I, I wished I had more time to do the freelance work than I had um, because it was, um, the projects were more exciting and actually I was being paid more for it as well than I was in my kind of steady three days a week job. So after a year and a half, I decided to go completely freelance um, and I'm now a filmmaker and a photographer. Uh, to some of my work, which you can find on my website, which is just johnaitkin.com. So now I make, uh, I, I document events, I document people, projects, um, I do headshots for people, I make crowdfunding films, I do all sorts of things, and it is great. Uh, and I'm completely self-employed now. So I just wanted to take you through that. Um, and this is the kind of like the breakdown of that career path so far with my age and when it all happened. Um, I wanted to take you through that because I wanted to kind of show that this wasn't an immediate decision. This was actually quite a, uh, a safe calculated decision that I'd made that had taken me years to reach really and it, it, was, it was a terrifying decision. That, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, like leaving that last job literally as I was handing over my resignation. I was like what am I doing? This is such a mistake but it ended up being the biggest kind of the best decision of my life um, and I think there's lots of fear there because um, going going completely self-employed there's the fear of there being no work um, people not giving you any projects to work on yeah and, and, and having no money there's lots of fear there um, but like I said this was the best decision that I'd ever made um, and I think that's for quite a few different reasons so the first reason is that I had a bank of clients who I knew were there, who I knew I had relationships with them, and I knew they had work to give me. So I knew that there was something for me to be doing. Um, I'd spent the last few years building on my own skills right from when I was started making the YouTube videos, which were hardly anybody watched them, but I still learned how to make videos and do something creative. And those skills I've just been developing through the years and were really kind of now informing the work that I was creating now. Um, it also, those, those years working in the creative industries has actually given me the confidence to kind of combine with the knowledge that I had to kind of approach situations and be like, I don't quite know how to do this yet, but I definitely could learn how to do it while you pay me to do this job. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, I'd also, I think probably most importantly, I'd saved some money. So I wasn't going into this completely like with a, a, an empty bank account, like I'd spent some time saving some money so that I had the money to cover myself if I had a few months without any work or if it completely, if everything went wrong, uh, I had some money to tide me over before I got another job. And I think that was really important to have there as kind of a backup, just for peace of mind. Um, and I think also my attitude, uh, I'm really, really flexible at how I work. And I think that really helped things. Um, and I think on a broader sense, even now, like if the right full-time role came along, I would really consider it because for me, my work is much more about what I'm actually making, what I'm doing and what makes me happy rather than say being my own boss. It may be completely different for you. You may, be want, to, you may want to be your own boss and that's like the key thing. Um, for me and for what I do, uh, I, I realized that I basically all of my clients became my bosses. So it wasn't quite like the, the sexy, oh, you're always going to be your own boss thing. It's kind of made out to be. So what does it actually mean to be self-employed? And I'm really going to go through the basics here. Um, and like I said, pop your questions in the chat afterwards and we can go through it together. So there are a couple of ways. And also you'll notice that I'm going to refer to notes for this bit because I want to get it right. <laughs> there are a couple of ways of working. Uh, the first is that you can be employed by a business uh, where you have a contract with them and you work for a specific amount of time or you work with them forever and they pay you regularly and they tell you what to do and you do it. They are your employer, you are their employee or you can be self-employed where you are your own business and you work for other businesses and you can also be called a freelancer or a contractor. So self-employed, freelancer, contractor, they're all kind of interchangeable depending on who you're talking to. As a self-employed person, there are a couple of different kind of business structures that you can be. Um, so I am a sole trader uh, and a sole trader is essentially a self-employed person who is the sole owner of their business. 
uh, and it's the simplest business structure out there, which is probably why it's the most popular. You can also be, be a limited company, which is a different kind of business structure, which uh, uh, this is technical, but it's its own legal identity. So it's separate from the people running it, even if that's just one person running it. Uh, and that remains the case. Uh, yeah, so that includes uh, the shareholders and the managers as well. Being a sole trader means that if your business goes into debt, then you are personally, personally responsible and liable, whereas being a limited company, it's separate to you and your personal finances. So I, like I said, I'm a sole trader, but I've got friends who do exactly the same thing as me, who are limited companies, and we look exactly the same, we're just different behind the scenes. Um, and, and it's just kind of it's kind of about what your priorities are and what your plans for the future, i.e. if you want to start hiring people as employees of your own. So have a look into that and work out what's going to be best for you. Now, we all pay tax, which is a percentage of our income, uh, okay, the money that we earn, and we pay it to the government, and this is called income tax. And the part of the government that's in charge of all of this, regardless of whether you're self-employed or you're employed by a business, is called HMRC, which stands for Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. People also refer to HMRC as the tax man. So I'm kind of like trying to go through all the bits that really confused me at the beginning. How much you pay changes depending on how much you earn. Uh, so if you earn under £100,000, which I'm going to take a guess is probably everybody here, then the first £12,500 of it, you get tax free. And this is called your personal allowance. So that just means that you won't pay any tax on it and you get to keep it all. That £12,500 is yours. The moment you go over that £12,500, you hit the first tax threshold on which you pay 20% tax. Let me just go to the next slide. You pay 20% tax on anything above that up to the next tax threshold, which is £50,000. If you earn over £50,000, then you pay 40% tax up to £150,000, of which you pay 45% tax. Um, this bit really confused me uh, when I started out actually for years, like an embarrassingly long amount of time. So there's an example on the right. Let's say that you earn £52,000 a year. You, get a personal allowance of £12,500 on which you pay no tax at all. That's yours to keep. On the next bit, which in the uh, pretty terrible diagram I put at the bottom because I'm a visual learner and I just needed to create something for my brain to understand it. Once you hit the yellow bit, the first tax threshold, you pay 20% of that money. And that is just the money within that threshold. So that doesn't include your personal allowance, which you always get to keep. This is just the money within that threshold of which would be 37 and a half thousand pounds. 20% tax would be seven and a half thousand pounds. And then you can see we've just crept above the 50,000 pound threshold, the 2000 pounds there of which you pay 40% tax, which in this case would be 800 pounds. I hope that's clear. If that's not, let me know in the question in the Q and A and we can go over it again. On top of that, oh, actually, sorry, one thing to know, like I said in the beginning, these bans change uh, potentially year by year. This is entirely up to the government who decide how much your personal allowance have been. I think in the time that I've been freelancing, it's gone from about 11, maybe 10 and a half thousand pounds to now 12 and a half thousand pounds. But these thresholds potentially change every year. So just be aware of that. Um, on top of that, there is something called national insurance, uh, and this is an extra payment or kind of a contribution on top of your income tax that goes towards things like your pension and your maternity allowance. Uh, just because uh, I didn't know this, but if you identify as male and you want to be self-employed and you want to have a kid, then you need to work out how to do that outside of the government benefits because your national insurance does not go towards any kind of paternity pay. Um, Obviously, I mean, I think this is grossly unfair and there are campaigns against it, but just be aware of that, that you've got to think outside of the government's benefits. Well, where does your tax actually go and why bother paying? So on the left there, there is the breakdown from a few years ago, so 2016, uh, of where the government decided to spend all of the money they collected in taxes. And you can see it kind of breaks down there uh, with the, the billions that they collected. Uh, and then on the right is my own tax. Um, yes, yeah, so that was my income tax and my national insurance combined. And you can see exactly where the government decided to spend it. Uh, 
and you can see actually welfare at the top, health and state pensions and so on. Uh, you may not like where the government spends your money, but unfortunately we don't have a choice on that. It's a political issue. Uh, but I trust, I try and look at it positively in the sense of one, that I'm earning enough money to actually pay tax in the first place, and that's an achievement in itself. And secondly, that it'll end up going towards services that I will probably use in the future, like the NHS. So try and think of it as a positive thing. Uh, you, if you are working for a business, so if you're not self-employed, if you're working for a business, then you will be uh, taxed at source. And this is called PAYE, which is pay as you earn. And this automatically gets given to the government. Uh, you'll see it on your pay slips. Uh, you will never see that money. You'll just see it kind of taken out minus from the amount that you earned that month. Uh, so it's super simple. As a self-employed person, you need to tell the government how much you've earned. And so you can give it to them. Uh, you need to go through that process yourself. Uh, and if you don't tell the government how much you've earned, uh, there can be severe repercussions. So you may get fined and have legal action with interest on the money as the longer it goes on. Uh, you may not be able to get any uh, maternity allowance. Uh, and if your husband, wife or civil partner doesn't pay national insurance contributions, then you won't get any bereavement support if they were to die. So it's definitely worth your while. Uh, and it's also just, just for a kind of a, so you're aware this is also where the expression cash in hand applies uh, so basically you're offering a service to somebody they're paying you you're taking their money but you're not declaring it to the government you're literally taking it and keeping it for yourself and not getting taxed on it which obviously means that you end up with more money however they'll catch up with you and you'll face legal consequences and it'll probably be way more costly than keeping it in the first place so basically be honest and declare your earnings it's just better for everybody so as a self-employed uh, self person, you need to declare your earnings and you do this by literally assessing your business over the last year. And this is called a self-assessment. Uh, so basically the government is trusting you to tell them how much you've earned and then they'll calculate how much you owe them. So somewhat confusingly, the tax year actually starts on the 6th of April and ends on the 5th of April the following year. So we refer to these years because it crosses over as 2018-2019. And we're currently in the tax year 2020 2021 you need to register your business to let the government know that you exist uh, this really isn't hard uh, there is a deadline you must register by which technically is the 5th of october in your second year of trading which basically means your second year of being a self-employed person but i would massively suggest you just register the moment you think about freelancing uh, just do it get it out of the way so it's not something you have to think about further down the line um, you just have to go to gov.co.uk sorry gov.uk uh, and you'll be asked to register a business name and a really short description of what you do mine is simply john aitken and a sentence saying i do photography and filmmaking and it's as simple as that once you've done that you will then get access to something called the government gateway uh, and this is where you will be given a unique number uh, have to make a password and then when every time you log in they will text you a number as well just to make it even more safe uh, you need to keep all of these numbers very safe somewhere so i just have a document on my computer where they're really easy to access i've also got my uh, national insurance number there as well just the, the easier you can make it for yourself the better um, and also it's really useful to give a, a hint of your password there as well, because inevitably you'll forget it year by year. But it's through this government gateway that you'll be sent messages like the one on screen at the moment, uh, where the moment it becomes the new tax year, they'll tell you that you need to complete your self-assessment for the previous tax year, things like that. Um, the actual self-assessment itself is an online form. Uh, I, nobody I know does it in paper anymore. Um, and the deadline for this form is the 31st of January every year. So we finished the last tax year in April and I need to submit my self-assessment by the 31st of January the following year. So you can see there that there is nine months of time to do that in, which is a massive amount of time. However, most people leave it until the 30th of January, which is really like both my parents are guilty of this, but I don't understand why they do it because it's so stressful. Don't do that. <laughs> You've got so much time beforehand to do it. So this year, I think I did mine in about July or August. Um, the, the, the actual form itself um, is it is long, but if you have all your things in order, 
then it can be really, really simple. And I think this year it took me, it took me like less than two hours, maybe an hour to get it completed. And all that stress was done, it was behind me. And it, would, it didn't mean that at the end of January, I would be phoning up HMRC, asking them questions because I'm confused about one bit. Um, and it, it's good to know that HMRC are very, they are human and they're very nice people, but they get so, so busy in January that you'll have to wait ages on the phone just to talk to anybody. So do it earlier. If you have any problems, that means you can actually phone them up and they'll really, they'll be able to chat it through with you and nobody will be stressed. So the form itself, like I said, it is quite long, but the majority of it probably won't actually apply to you because it covers all sorts of things like, were you the director of another company? Have you got any assets out there that you need to declare? Has your business made any donations to charities? All sorts of things. And as you can see there, a lot of it is kind of drop down boxes or like yes, no answers and putting in figures. So really, really quite easy. Once you've put all the right information in there, you need to declare that to your knowledge, everything is correct. Uh, and then HMRC will calculate your tax and how much you owe them. Uh, this can be quite a shock if you haven't prepared yourself, but if you are organized, then you'll be able to work out a rough amount beforehand. Um, it's also good to know that if you don't submit your self-assessment and pay your tax bill on time, like I said, 31st of January, then there are fines. Also, you need to be aware that extra payments get added in. So if you, are, uh, if you have a student loan and you start earning, uh, earning enough to take you over the student loan threshold, then they'll start asking for payments on that. And that'll be added to your overall amount with your national insurance. Also, as a self-employed person, unless you owe less than a thousand pounds tax in total, you'll be asked to make a payment for the next tax bill at the same time. And this, this caught me out so hard <laughs> uh, and this is based on your earnings from the year that you're submitting and this is called a payment on account uh, so there are two payments on account each of them is half of your current tax bill uh, sorry each of them makes up half your current tax bill one gets paid by the 31st of january and the second by the 31st of july uh, i I'll be honest, I don't quite understand why HMRC do this. I think it's quite a cruel thing. Um, there are There is reasoning on the website, but it kind of just makes me angry. Uh, but the result is that for a lot of newly self-employed people, you'll typically face a tax bill, which might be 50% higher than you'd be expecting. So again, this is where you need to be organized, just so you know that these things are coming up ahead. But how do we actually know how much we owe HMRC or even how much we've earned? We do that through invoicing. So when you work for somebody, um, you do the job and then you send them an invoice. And an invoice is base, it's a very basic document saying uh, somebody must pay somebody else and how and when to do it. And you can see here, these are a couple of my old invoices. Um, and you can see uh, at the top, it includes things like my address, the client's address, uh, it's got the date on it, um, my own invoice numbering system, literally just started from one six years ago. Now I'm like 150 or something like that, depending on what kind of thing you do. Uh, you may be doing invoices every week. You may be doing them every six months. Uh, it's also got on uh, their reference numbers, which will help them do the admin at their end, which you want to make this as easy as possible for them to send you money because otherwise it will take a while. Uh, it's got things like this kind of service that I offered and how much that cost. And then most importantly, it's got my bank details at the bottom for them to pay me. Um, there's also space on there. So you can add things like um, a kind of a more kind of legal statement saying uh, this needs to be paid within 30 days of me sending it and you receiving it. Um, and also there are lots of templates for things like that online, including the legal language, if you want to include it, because there are kind of rules in place. That means if an, if an invoice is paid, uh, late, then it, it actually can start accruing interest. You can charge interest to the client. May not be the best route to go down if you want to keep the client as a friend, but it's out there to kind of scare a client into actually paying you. Otherwise, they have to pay more. And just a little tip for organizing invoices, I do it by the tax year. So you can see the folder there. And then at the start of the, uh, the file name for every invoice, I put the date in number form backwards. Uh, so you can see we are at the 14th of January 2021 and then that becomes 2021 January 14 and this just means that all my invoices in that folder line up chronologically and they're super easy to find uh, whenever I need to so the sooner you start organizing yourself the better you will you'll love yourself much later down the line 
Uh, but we need to keep track in general about what's happening with all of these invoices. So to do that, I use what looks like quite a complicated spreadsheet. Um, and this is basically where I track um, all the invoices that I've sent out. I track whether they've been paid, who they were to, how much they were for, and add it up for the rest of the year. Again, there are loads of templates out there to do this online. Um, and there are also services out there as well. So I'm going to be switching to a service called QuickBooks soon because they've got an offer at the moment where I think it's about four pounds a month. They can give you uh, access to this digital version of the spreadsheet, basically, where you just have to put in all of your kind of information and then it will do all of the calculations for you and make things very, very simple, especially when you get to January and you need to do your self-assessment. So, yeah. Basically, I, I can't stress how being organized is, is beneficial for you. <laughs> um, we also need to track things that are going out of your business. So your business will incur running costs uh, and you can actually deduct these. These are called expenses and you can deduct these from what's called your taxable profit. Uh, so the taxable profit is what you get taxed on. So as an example, let's say that your earnings, you bring in 40,000 pounds you then have £10,000 of, um, of expenses, things that you've needed to run your business with. So you're left with £30,000. £30,000 is what you'll get taxed on. That's your taxable profit. So essentially, expenses will bring your tax bill down. There are lots of things you can claim for, but you do need to be a little bit careful. Um, I would advise going to the, the HMRC website and actually going through this list to work out what, what's relevant to you. Uh, for instance, you can actually claim part of your mobile phone bill. So let's say, say your phone bill costs 200 pounds a year. Of this, you, you look at a month on your, your phone bill and you look at it and you, you're like, actually about 60% of this is personal, 40% of it is for business. That means you can claim that 40% uh, as a tax deductible expense. Uh, so about 80 quid. And um, yeah, there's lots of things like travel costs, uh, clothing, staff costs, all sorts of things. Um, a few examples of my expenses as a filmmaker and photographer include the Adobe uh, Creative Cloud Suites, uh, like Photoshop Premiere, uh, Google Drive Storage, I've got Vimeo as well, um, my phone bill, um, and also things like felted pens for workshops, when we could actually meet each other in real life. Um, and also, now that I am working from home, I'll be putting some of my internet bill on there as well. So yeah, but to do this, you do need to keep documentation because you need to be able to prove that you actually bought that thing to HMRC because, and this is important to know, HMRC can go back six years uh, and ask you questions about your self-employed business from six years ago. So uh, imagine we're in 2027 and HMRC asks you, okay, we need to see the receipts for 2021. You need to be able to prove that you, you did all these things that you said you did. Uh, and you need to be able to do that really, really easily. So again, I have a folder system like this with a kind of month by month basis. Uh, and then I have digital images or PDFs of everything in there. So you don't have to keep the physical copy of a receipt. You can take a photo of it and that's good enough. Uh, and then the majority of the things that I buy actually get sent uh, email receipts. So I just save them as a PDF, put them in there, log them in my spreadsheet. And then I know that they're all safe in case HMRC come calling. So yeah, if you've got all of this documented, and I realize it's quite scary, but it's it's quite simple as long as you get to grips with it. Like if you've got this documented and update that actually doing your self-assessment can be quite smooth. <laughs> um, I, but it's about kind of working out if you need to be strict with yourself or not. So do you need to spend an hour every Friday doing the admin for the previous week? Or if you're like me, memory's terrible, just do it straight away. The moment I send an invoice or the moment I buy something that will cluster as an expense, I document it right away so I don't have to worry about it. Okay, that's, that's the really boring stuff. Let's finish by talking about worth. So I wanna be really open about money because I think it's really important uh, for many, many reasons. Uh, I, think, uh, I think in the creative industries, we're really, we can be really bad about talking about money because um, I think some people feel like we're in competition with each other. Um, also, uh, a lot of us are making, in some form, we're making art, and a lot of people don't like mixing art and money. Um, whereas I personally believe that we're creative people, we are doing something, we're making something, we should be paid fairly for it. Um, and also, I think it's 
it's, it's good to be open about money with your peers because you know you can find out who's, who's charging what. Uh, and also I think just generally, and especially I think for minorities, it's really good to be kind of open about money um, because otherwise the creative industries will be full of people like me who, who look like me uh, taking lots of money and everyone else won't know how much they're earning. So let's be honest and open and transparent. So um, it's very hard to work out how much to charge as a freelancer. Um, some industries have set rates, but then this can change depending on your experience. And also nobody likes to announce how much they charge because that means that they can't charge another customer even more. Or some producers uh, have a set budget, for instance, and they might be a bit cagey about that because they've got to get a job done with that set amount of money. So they're never gonna to come to you and say, I have this much, will you do it for that? They wait for you to come and say, this is how much I charge. Uh, but there are people out there who will ensure that you aren't getting ripped off. You just have to be careful that you're not taken for a ride. Um, so yeah, in, in 2014, when I started freelancing, my first ever client actually told me how much I should be charging at that point in my life. And she said, 120 pounds a day. I thought that was great. That was more money than I'd ever been paid before. In 2016, it was a couple of years later, uh, I got more experience, I, my skills had increased, I started charging £150. That £30 felt monumental looking back. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's 30 quid extra a day. Uh, then I, I did a project where this person approached me and they said, I'm sorry, I want you to do this editing for, editing for me, but I've only got £400 to pay you for two days work, is that okay? And I was like, that's fine. Yeah, that's totally fine. So it moved up to £200 a day. And then I did a, uh, a little course with the Prince's Trust, basically developing my business and creating a business plan. And part of that was doing some research into how much people were charging around me. And I did an anonymous questionnaire to lots of people I knew in the creative industries, just asking them how much they thought typically they, they would expect to pay a filmmaker, for instance, per day. And the average came out at £250. So I put my prices up to £250 and nobody blinked. Everyone just accepted that and they were like, yeah, this is standard, which was great. Uh, and then in 2020, yeah, I, I went up to about 300 pounds. Um, and then this, this, this is quite a, like mentally, it's, it's quite a, a weird thing to get your head around because then this ties into your own worth and your own value and lots of other factors as well. For instance, if I know a client is rich, and when I say that, I mean, it's a, a national organization who are doing massive things, then I know they've got budget to pay me. So I may charge them a little bit more. If, if I'm working on a project or with a business who are tiny, I know they've got no money, but I really love the work and I really wanna do it, I may charge them way less. Uh, so a lot of it is kind of making a judgment call and working out how much you actually think is right. Uh, an example of this was they, um, I recently started a job where the kind of producer said that the budget wasn't huge, so everyone was going to be working on reduced rates. And uh, is that okay? What would your day rate be? And I said, oh, 250 pounds. And they were like, oh, that's totally fine. And I realized I should have gone in a bit higher than that because I think everyone else is being paid more than me. But you live and learn. Uh, and, and this won't be the same for every creative job as well. That same producer told me that for their work with those big national organizations, they charge 700 pounds a day. Uh, Last year, I worked with a speaker who, for a two-hour lecture, was paid £10,000. So take from that what you will. Um, but one way of working out kind of a rough day rate is to think, what is my kind of dream salary? Like, how much do I want to earn over an entire year? And then divide that by 100 working days. And so someone once told me this a few years ago, they were like, as a self-employed person, think I'm going to try and work 100 days this year. Uh, the other days will be spent on admin, on marketing, all the other things that come into running a company. Uh, but I'm going to try and work 100 days. So you take that dream salary, divide it by 100, and it gives you a day rate to start with. So if I wanted to earn £25,000 in a year, I divide that by 100, it would give me £250 a day. So... That's a good way to start with. Uh, but like I said, my, my day rates may change depending on who I'm talking to and also the service that I'm providing. So if I'm taking some photos of somebody, some headshots, it may take me half a day to actually take the photos and edit them. I may only charge them 150 quid for it. Whereas for some video production, I may charge them more. For a talk like this, it will be a completely different set of rates. So you've got to kind of work that out for yourself. Um, 
I said I was going to be really transparent about money and this feels really weird and I don't mean it to be a flex at all, but here is how much I actually earn for each of those uh, career moments. Um, and you can kind of see me going from the part-time to then uh, part-time and freelancing to then fully freelancing. And then towards the bottom, you can see a very, very big number, which is the uh, a, a number that I never genuinely ever thought that I would earn. And it still makes me feel quite weird to this day. Um, but I just wanted to kind of show you how unpredictable my freelancing, free, freelancing earnings have been. Um, and yeah, kind of like on, on surface level as well, like that, that, that 2018, 2019, that 46,000 pounds, that kind of in my monumental amount of money, um, that was down to uh, a big reason, which was somebody approached me, I think it was in March of the tax year, and said, I want you to do this massive project for me, um, but I need to pay you before the end of the tax year. So they ended up giving me this gigantic chunk of money, then they actually did the work the following year. So it's kind of slightly weird skewing of numbers in here. Uh, and then also you can see at the very end that uh, at the moment, I think I'm on track to earn about £25,000 this year. I don't know yet, haven't got to April yet, um, which, which looks great, which is great. In reality, actually, uh, it's probably about 18000 and the, um, the government has stepped in and given me a self-employed income uh, grant because of the COVID situation, which take me up to about £25,000. Um, but you can see, Actually, uh, sorry, uh, with, with that gigantic year, um, obviously I paid a lot of tax, um, which was like a, a, so much tax, <laughs> like a hideous amount of tax that I don't even want to say, um, which uh, was fine because I'm happy to pay tax. Like it's, a, it's, a, it's good to pay tax, um, but, and it, and it would have been a shock if I hadn't been prepared, but I was prepared. And I think this is, what, if, you, if you take anything from this, this talk, I want you to do this, is that the need for need for separate bank accounts. Um, so I would suggest that if you are freelancing, that you go and get two new bank accounts. And these can just be normal standard current accounts. They don't have to be specific business accounts that the bank will offer you, but they come with certain charges. They just have to be normal bank accounts. And the first one, is that your that would be your main freelancing business account so that's where you tell all your clients to pay money into and that's also the account that you pay for expenses for so all of your business costs all of your business finances get streamlined through this one bank account uh, and that's one for just simplicity but also if hmrc do come calling and they want to see your bank account from six years ago if you've got it separated from your personal finances that means they won't ever see your personal finances they'll just see that business account um, which personally, I'm not sure I'd want to see, I'd want anyone looking at my personal finances just because there are a mess of bills coming in and out everywhere. Um, but it'll be so much clearer for them to see a business bank account. And the second bank account is for tax. So every time I get paid, I straight away put 25% of whatever I've been paid into that separate bank account where it gets hidden away. I don't even think about it. It's there until January when I'm paying my tax bill. Um, and yeah, so I, I put 25% in there, which is more than the 20% tax threshold I expect to be in, but that extra 5% means that it covers my student loans and it covers my national insurance and also goes towards that extra tax, uh, extra payment on account for the next year as well. So yeah, but everyone does this differently. Like I've got a friend who does it by the rule of thirds where every time he gets paid, he puts a third into his tax account, a third into his current account to spend on life and a third into his savings account. So you've just got to work out whatever, whatever system will work for you, but it really is advisable that you have this tax account and you put money straight away in there just so you don't spend it. And it means you've got it ready and waiting to pay your tax bill at the end of the year. But going back to worth, um, and I think what changes your worth, um, like I said, uh, when the pandemic struck last year, my business changed. Um, I, I, like everything changed for everyone. Um, I think within the first week of it, all my work got cancelled. Um, and so that's something that interesting could change my worth because now I'm having to kind of adapt. Um, I've, I've had to move entirely online now. I don't think I'm going to be doing any filming or photography work out in real life or major work for quite a long time just because I did some of that in between lockdowns 
and it was fine, that was safe, but then I actually got COVID independently of that. I don't want to get it again, nor give it to my partner, and also I don't want to risk anybody else out there. So I have a feeling that I'm probably going to be working online for like the next year or so until 30-year-olds get given a vaccine, whenever that might be. Um, but I think that's something that I really want to stress, um, and it's kind of what I want to end on as well. And a big part of freelancing is about adapting and it's about resilience um, and it's about kind of fitting new situations, new workplaces, new people, because you're going to meet so many different people and have so many different projects potentially. Um, and I hope that kind of going through this journey of like my, my career journey, which feels slightly narcissistic, but I hope it kind of, fe it, it, it kind of shows that there there is kind of logical boring side to self-employment about the numbers, about paying your tax, but also part of it, especially with the day rates, um, part of it is kind of making it up. Like worth is kind of a, um, it's in people's heads. Um, yes, you have experience. Yes, you can do this, you can do that. But also worth is about what you say you're worth. Um, so now I feel confident knowing that I've got these years behind me saying I am worth this amount now. Um, and like I said at the very beginning about learning what it is that you can do and that you can kind of effectively sell to other people. That was a really empowering moment for me. And I hope all of you have had that moment or you're going to have that moment. Um, and it's, it's really nice to be able to say, like, I'm an expert in this. And if you want my knowledge, you can pay me for it. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna leave it on that note. Um, this is some of my work, like I said, uh, it's all on johnaitkin.com if you wanna go and have a look. Um, and yeah, if you've got any questions, please pop them in the Q&A box. Uh, Laura, should we answer some questions? We should, definitely. Um, firstly, uh, thank you so much for such a brilliant talk. You covered everything I could possibly have wanted you to be um, uh, uh, talking about. So I really, really appreciate that. Um, and I, it really uh, resonated with me. I, before I took this role, um, all our lovely rebels, I had spent probably at least 16 years as a freelancer and so had similar approaches. I always made sure I'd filed my tax return by September at the very latest. I liked mm -hmm. the closure of finishing them off uh, almost as soon as the financial year was finished. I found that that really um, helped me understand where I was at, what I was likely to be facing, how that year had ran, how I felt about it. I almost did it as an act of um, reflection, a bit like people do the end yeah. of year uh, reviews about their, um, their work, what they want to do, values and things like that. Um, I also, I used to be a 30% into the savings account, so same I had. Mm -hmm. Initially, I just literally used a current account I already had and then and a, and a savings account. Um, I used to always put 30% across uh, to allow for tax NI and everything else. Um, I also really quite liked doing the accounts because it meant I had a sense of how much I'd put in my savings and I could pay myself as a bonus that wasn't going yeah. to the tax man. <laughs> so there is that, that advantage that actually if you put that money aside and your expenses or your final accounts are such that actually you don't owe all of that money, then you've built yourself a savings pot every yeah. single year, which actually puts you in a better position. And again, used to give me financial capacity for taking risks on new projects i could either pay myself it or i could use it to invest invest in some taking a risk on something that i wouldn't otherwise be able to do so i could use that value in a different way um and i used to find i was thinking about your thing with uh your list of acceptable expenses like you said with vimeo and things like that um i most of my work was as a choreographer and so also I could, do, I was able to claim uh, my physio sessions uh, mm. to prevent and, for, and my own training. And I could claim my work clothes, which is so technical dance clothing and the such, um, and also research. So uh, visits to see shows or directors, I was then being approached to be employed by, by all of that kind of stuff. I had to make sure that I could really, um, clarify that with continuity uh for so that if they came back to me and asked why it was very clear and I similarly had a, a spreadsheet which I would use off of my bank account entries and it had similar to John's with a tally down it of office expenses bank account charges uh travel expenses and it had a, an additional column that said exactly 
what it was and why it was. That was a trip to this then correlated with the diaries or something else. And so it was really clear that even though that wouldn't normally be a straight away um, area of expense, it was a justifiable because of the specific industry I was in. And there was continuity across the years of, of why that was there. Um, so yes, it just made me think of all of these things and all the tricks that helped me out so greatly in my approach. Um, but uh, there is a really there were two interesting questions uh, that came in, um, one of which I think you've half uh, uh, answered, which is, yeah, how are you finding a work and doing so, you know, your your shifts and your work sounds like it's quite dramatic at the moment with uh, from having kind of like uh, being in South Korea, videoing projects and the such to kind of like now working at a much social distance kind of place. Are you finding that still a satisfying challenge? Are you finding you're still getting enough work or because you, as you said, like almost all of us who still had companies, you know, at, um, at the beginning of lockdown, you know, all the work literally disappeared overnight. Um, how are you yeah. feeling at this point in the journey? Um, oh, we're all being honest. I mean, it's I, I, I'm not feeling that great. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm feeling OK. I'm feeling OK. I'm feeling so much better than I was uh last year in about june because uh, i was like what on earth is gonna happen to me to everyone i know who does the same thing um and yeah i i mean it is sad that the kind of the opportunities are no longer the same um and they don't feel as creative um or as kind of valuable to my own development as a, as a creative. Um, however, I'm still massively thankful that there is stuff out there for me to do. Um, and that has changed. That has now changed to a lot of editing Zoom calls, much like this, uh, it's where people will have done a talk and they needed it tidying up. Um, and I know how to edit and I, I can do that. And I have a nice computer here at home. Um, and so I feel very, very fortunate that I, my career path put me in a position where I can do that because I've I, one, one of the um, one of the little films I made in between lockdowns last year was actually for Watershed when it was reopening, um, and we did it very distanced, very social distance. Everyone was masked up. It was all done because they would, basically wouldn't let anybody in the building without it being the toughest of, of um, I was going to say security, but it's not like the COVID police or anything, but like the toughest of guidelines um but like the person I was working with the person who did the filming for me while I directed him that was the first job he'd had in months and months and he was totally relying on the government kind of handout um and so there was a lot of um also like precarity and, and and fear there as well because um and also also uh, I haven't thought this through properly yet but there was a lot of stuff around how much are we as a collective the creative industry is being valued by our government um and also and also by people who don't do creative things who suddenly found themselves spending all day watching netflix um reading books doing all these things that creative people have made uh and got paid for to, to do um and so that was quite a um i hope I hope people realized the value of the creative industries at that point. Mm. Um, and I think, I think in a way they did, though also I think a lot of it is still taken for granted, which is, is kind of inevitable, I think, because you don't watch television to think about who made it, or a lot of, most people don't. You watch it because you want to be entertained by something for half an hour, and that's fine. That's what it's there to do. Um, but yeah, it's been a very, very weird year. And like I mentioned, I... It may be cynical, but I, I don't think that my what I'm going to be doing is going to change for a um, quite a long time. That if I think about it too much, makes me quite sad because I genuinely do think it's going to be like end of this year, if not start of next year, before things can truly go back to uh, a situation where I feel it's safe to do so, and I don't, I'm not putting anybody else at risk. Um, so I think I imagine for the next year, I'm going to be sat at my computer seeing what comes in yeah that's a really tricky uh situation um so um i'm gonna uh change the tack a little bit and ask you um uh 
a, probably a devil's advocate question because uh, thank you so much for your honesty about um, how much you you were earning at different times and over those years and how that freelance split of income was going it's really I think it's really helpful for people to see it's I've always found it's really helpful and I've made to tell other people this and you know um and, and being honest where people have advised and advice of my company previously and I've told them exactly how much we earn a year and they go oh we thought you were earning five six times that amount as a company and you see them relax and you go no the ground is the ground is wonky at the moment um yeah. but uh that year where you did have a very financially successful um, year um, or that project that brought in so much money to lead to such a financially successful year. Was that one of the slightly, um, oh, that's a leading question. Was it as creatively fulfilling as a year um, as maybe the, uh, the, pre, the, the, the following year um entirely freelance how does that was was earning more uh actually a golden ticket or um not uh it's a very very interesting question um i i won't lie i really enjoyed earning a lot of money and having <laughs> <laughs> it was really nice it meant i could um do lots of things which was really really great however creatively i did not feel fulfilled at all that year i was basically making the same video over and over and over again which meant by the end of it i was really good at making that work but i was so bored by it so bored except actually i wasn't bored because i didn't have time to be bored because i was so burnt out from doing all these projects at the same time um that were essentially make a two minute video about this thing that's happening go and film them go and edit them a few rounds of feedback done mm. So by the end of that year, I did have a lot of work to show for it. And I had a lot of money to show for it, but um, I'm not sure how proud I was of anything that I made that year, uh, if I'm honest. Yeah, <laughs> so, it's a really, yeah. it's sometimes it's a really tricky conundrum. And I think that often comes into, um, uh, as you said, the, the value of when we choose to do things at a lesser rate or when we choose to mm. work for free. Um, I, there were times where I was being approached about speaking gigs where I was being advised to charge say five thousand pounds for a speaking gig and business class flights to wherever that was and they weren't batting an eyelid about that and I'm like How's it and yeah. you know and within a two-week window I would be speaking at a very small games conference led by some really extraordinary independents and they'd be like we've got 75 pounds and mm -hmm. some travel money for you but you, you know, the return of value within a community, the return of investment in a value exchange yeah. with those people, with an, um, helping, helping colleagues and people who I held in high esteem, uh, you know, was something which I would often end up doing. And so I think that kind of that, uh, do you have a set of values or do you have a set of key things, which if you were making a choice about working for free or working for under your day rate that you go this has to tick this that and the other before i would consider that exchange i probably do i just i'm not quite sure if i can articulate that i guess it's probably like do, is it doing good in the world is it uh really really interesting to me um do i think it might lead to something else uh, and there's kind of I guess there's a few different approaches to that like i've been completely the same as you like some things have been really well paid other things not so much but i've been so it's kind of balanced out between the two because like the more well paid things have meant that i can go and do those things for very little money um but also a lot of the things that where people don't have a budget to pay you loads that's often because they're trying to do loads of good in the world <laughs> like with people who could really do with hearing that and i think that's why i've um it's like it's always trying to help people at the ladder behind you kind of thing. And um, I guess part of my, maybe part of my attitude is about kind of like giving back, like may, maybe, um, maybe I have like a set amount of, of time per year that I'm like, I want to, I really want to help people with this amount of time that I have. How do I go about doing that? Yeah. Uh, in, in a more um, financial point of view, there was one particular project where uh, I was approached no, I saw it on Twitter actually, where this woman, she was at university in Bristol and she was running for 
student union president or something like that. And I think she just tweeted quite flippantly. She was like, I really want to make a video, but I don't know how to do this. Is anyone out there who could help? And I had been toying with the idea of what it'd be like to work with influencers at the time, horrible word. Um, but I was really interested to be like, what would it be like to work with like a big YouTuber or something? How much would I even charge? What would that process look like? So I approached her and I said, look, I'm happy to make you a really short video um, for free because I'm really interested in this process. And I feel, I feel it could be beneficial for both of us. Um, and so I was quite strict about it. Yeah, actually, that was the thing. I was really strict from the beginning. I was like, right, I'm going to allocate this project. And I, I told her, I was like, I'm going to give you a day of my time. Um, and so I think we spent about an hour and a half filming in this little office that I had access to. So that was all free. Um, and then I spent the equivalent of a rest of a day editing it. Um, I'm not even sure. I think she may have, I may have said you can have like one round of feedback kind of thing. And I'll do some adjustments based on that. And then um, the video went out, uh, publicized by the student union. Uh, she did really well. She didn't actually get the role, but she still did really well. And she shared it herself on Twitter and had quite a big following and she tagged me in it. And she was really complimentary about me in it. And she was like, oh, like hire John, blah, 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 kind of thing, which is great. And then like a week later, I was approached by somebody saying, look, I work for this big organization and I saw what you did with that video. We'd love you to make some other videos like that for us. And like in total, doing that one free video, that one day of work actually led to about £8,000 worth of work over the course of the next six months, just because of doing that. So I guess I'd, I'd done it in quite a calculated way where... I was happy to work for free, but I was really strict about it. And I knew that it would benefit me. I wasn't just doing it for the sake of someone else doing it. I was like, there was something in there. Even if that money hadn't come in the end, there was still something of value in there for me. Um, and I think that's that's probably how I advise a lot of people to go about doing it. Like, what, what is in it for you? Um, because I think there's, a, there's the... Um, there's the very traditional knee-jerk response in the creative industries about never working for free, mm. which I, I think there's some merit in that definitely because there are people out there who will take advantage of you. But if you can actually see there's value in it for you as well, then I would say mm. be strict about it and do it. Yeah, I think that's a really lovely way because what you did really clarify really clearly though with her was the amount of time that was in that gift and what the purpose of that was and yeah. what that return was for you. I was thinking that um, both of us, uh, John and I, used to be based at the Pervasive Media Studio. You are given your desk space there and in exchange you return, you agree to be professionally interruptible, which means in an eight hour working day, you could lose 15 minutes helping somebody out or two hours. And it's mm. potluck on the day, but it means that you have the opportunity to ask for advice or skills or ask somebody who works in the field and go, you know have I got this right or you know unlock an up ability to upskill um and it works both ways but it does mean that you can end up gifting quite a lot of your time into the community but personally I always thought that was an absolutely incredibly valuable exchange and I would yeah. never hesitate to give my time to that person I might sometimes be I need to finish this little bit of thinking and this this tiny thing I'm doing and then I can give you half a day or an hour and a minute if you know what I mean however much it needed and so sometimes the way which we give that free value is in our locations or our community or our investment that we give as well I think um, also actually just leading on from that that's a really interesting point because um apart from a few tweets every year I've never marketed myself everything I've got has been through word of mouth through conversations exactly like that uh, where I have I've approached a conversation being like, this, this could be a two-way thing. It could be like me telling someone about something that they could do for a little bit, but usually something always comes back, whether that's just like a friendly face, a connection later on, um, or actual work, uh, because they'll tell somebody else and they'll tell somebody else. Um, so yeah, I, I would, um, like I think networking is horrible. I like the concept of yeah. networking is horrible, but like actually just, just, knowing people and being nice to people is probably my best marketing method that I've ever had um yeah yeah and um I just there's two questions that come in here and also I have a feeling um uh, I'm just trying to figure out whether I've misunderstood how our webinar is working tonight um Victoria Jones if you can either pop in the chat or in the Q&A um whether or not you've still got your hand raised because I thought I saw it go up but I can't now see it on our system um there's a question uh, that came in from uh, which is about does your day rate include VAT, which is a really, 
really good um, thing to clarify. So VAT is, as we know, when we go to the tills and things like that, we pay for a good, uh, and actually you often see it in Amazon now, there is, there is a value added tax, which is set by the government. It's usually about 20% these days. Um, if you're a VAT registered company, which means in theory you're earning over the, I think it's about £80,000 a year yeah. as a limited company. You have to be within a limited company and earning that. You can separate off and you can receive back a, a proportion of the VAT that your goods cost you and you can charge VAT on your services, on specific services. Um, but you have to be a VAT registered organization that has to be a limited company it cannot be you cannot be i don't believe vat registered as a sole trader i again, don't think so i don't because yeah. i know nothing about vat right because i've never had to yeah yeah so the only thing that might happen as a sole trader uh, or as an individual invoicing is if um you work for if you're doing work for a larger organization they and there were expenses um that were incurred like you bought a hard drive which um, was then going to be given to that organization with the data on it. Say I'm using you as your work as an example there. Um, they may ask you on the invoice to put the cost of the hard drive and separate out its net and its VAT because they can reclaim that back within their systems at a later point in time. But you wouldn't as a freelancer be adding, uh, you wouldn't as a sole trader be adding VAT additionally at the end of your invoice unless you are a you are registered for VAT which is usually only if you're a limited company earning over about 80,000 a year um, that doesn't counter anything that's not contradictory to anything you know not at all I mean I saw I the only thing I know about VAT is that I got caught out last year in that I was trying to uh, so I was trying to someone was working for me so mm -hmm. I was contracting them I told them that the budget was 600 pounds that they were no sorry no uh, I asked them what their day rate was and they said 300 pounds I was like okay great the budget is 600 pounds that means I can do two days for me and then I think they sent me the invoice and it had extra VAT on top of it as well I was like there literally isn't any money in the budget to pay for this so um maybe a question to ask people just to confirm whether they're going to charge VAT or not it is uh, and actually absolutely that because we've also with my external company uh, there have been times where uh, we've organized a, a contract with an organization and they've gone oh you're VAT registered and you're like yes uh, um, and they've had to renegotiate with their funders or something so it's always again all these money questions all this conversation it's always so good to just be having a frank conversation having a yeah. um a stock sentence or something that you just put into your emails that makes you feel less nervy about it nervy is the wrong word there but i'm wondering if you do that as well where you sometimes have a um uh an automatic paragraph that when somebody approaches you fresh for work that you feel that you you know you copy and paste in that allows you to feel confident and more brave about bringing finance into that first that first conversation say or something like that do you do that trick um, I don't actually. I'm just trying to work out how I always approach it. I think um, I, I'm. I think I'm probably just quite bold about it, and um, I recognise that's quite a uh, that's come with experience and also probably come with privilege as well that I feel enabled to do that. And I will, depending on who it, who it is, I will potentially uh, uh, say. This is how much I charge, knowing that I'd be happy to go down a little bit as well, so that if it does seem a little bit high for them, they could come back and then say, oh, we're afraid we can't manage that. And I could say, well, actually, how about we go down to this, which may actually be my normal day rate. Um, but then I'm also uh, quite brave, I guess, about saying, is there budget? What is the budget for this? And at least being that first person to initiate that conversation, even though it might become a back and forth. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, but that what you've just suggested sounds pretty good to be honest. And I think that's also quite a, a, a thing to note is that with, with freelancing and self-employment, I, I was never going to stop learning how to do stuff. And like, and I, I went to a, um, a seminar, yes, a webinar yesterday uh, about self-employment, and I learned things that I didn't know. <laughs> it's like you're always going to end up learning new things, and also um, I, I, re realistically. 
slightly, some people have slightly contradictory information as well, which is why I'm always like, go to the official pe people, go to HMRC and actually get this confirmed. Yeah. Because um, people in the creative industries that I've met before have said slightly conflicting things because mm -hmm. they've been told by other people who've been told by other people and it's kind of filtered through and changed. And also, like I said, the rules change occasionally. Yeah. Uh, like the thresholds, numbers change, all sorts of things change. So um, keeping yeah open dialogue with as many pe people as possible, but also just doing, I guess, common sense, like fact checking, doing your research, just to make sure that you are so happy with what you're doing and the way you're doing it, and that you can um, evidence it. And if it comes to it, defend it potentially years the, later. Yeah, and that's the thing is, it is uh, being able to defend it. And that's why I was saying I could do that. I could make a, uh, a conscious decision that actually being able to prevent and maintain myself post injuries, say, and that to continue my own professional development and my training were absolutely key to my work as a choreographer. And mm -hmm. they were. I couldn't do my job without investing in those. And the same as that a professional athlete has a, a coach and uh you know and so on and so forth um uh but i wouldn't necessarily uh claim the entire of a gym membership say or something like that it would depend i would make a just i never had gym memberships i at the time so no, i don't know what my no. would be. but you know you, you have to, you have to be able to defend it and they and there is a there is a rule of thumb that people say is that they go oh they never they never um they never investigate the small self-employed so if you're just small it doesn't matter whatever um it's done by random uh number allocation you are just as likely to be investigated by hmrc as sorry excuse me i breathed in at the same time as trying to talk and therefore it didn't work um as uh, hmrc um if you're small as if you're a big company you just and that's why you that's why just having clear systems and keeping your records of stuff it, it makes such a difference um, there's another really good question that's come in here, um, which is uh, if or when you found out that other people working with you on a project were getting paid more than you, did you do anything about that or did you take it on the chin? Ooh, um, that, I, I don't think that's ever happened to me, which probably says a lot about transparency of people and actually saying how much we're earning. Um, I have, I, actually, I think what I have occasionally done is I've worked on projects with people and after the project's done, I've asked them how much they are actually being paid for it, just out of interest and curiosity. And then I think I've taken that into account for future projects. So it hasn't become a big thing during the actual work, but it's like yet another kind of uh like mental thing for me to be like oh actually i'm just as good as that person the work that they were doing i'm going to put my prices up to match that because yeah. if people are paying them to do it then they should pay me to do it as well yeah. um i yeah i don't know how i'd react and again um again when i mentioned about kind of like minorities especially um and the people i've worked with i don't know how i'd react i like to think that i would uh be supportive and help kick up a little bit of a fuss if I did find out there was um, a big disparity in the way that a team or my team or the people I was being I was working with are being paid um, I haven't yet had that situation um, maybe I work with good people who are being paid well I don't know um, but it's, again it's about the transparency which is I think I think you lead by example as well and um, uh, I, again, I understand that there's privilege in, in the sense that I was happy to show how much I earned for each of those jobs, because really I earned quite a lot for, for, for in my career, like I, I've earned quite a lot of money and um, that has been down to multiple factors, right place at the right time. Uh, I, I, it's a very British thing to not to be immodest, but I, I am good at what I do and I um, and, and I'm quite nice to people, so they want to employ me again. Um, and I can't remember where I was going with that. But oh yeah, but because I earn quite a lot of money, I'm happy to kind of display that. Saying that, actually, there's also an element of shame of being in the creative industries and earning a relatively decent amount of money, because it's almost embarrassing, because you know so many people out there aren't earning that much money when they really should be for what they're doing. 
So it's really weird. And it's kind of like this duality of feeling of like wanting to be open, but also kind of wanting to hide the fact that I'm quite successfully yeah. financially at what I do. It's very, very strange tension. Yeah. And, and I think, and I, uh, I really applaud you for having this conversation with us tonight, because actually I think well, the key bit there is that actually we should, everyone should be able to earn at this level and this parity. Um, and I, uh, the, the, this will vary year to year. I have had years previously in my self-employed career where I had similarly been earning maybe 20, um, 25k a year over a number of years because there's a set in, of recurring roles or jobs that have just kind of landed I had a year where one of those roles got um, removed very very abruptly and suddenly I was missing a key um, uh, anticipated income stream for about six months before I could pick up enough work to counter it and then I was very thankful that every year I'd been saving a little bit of money and there was a savings pot which could tide yeah. me through that six months, um, which is a bit like your friend saying the, the rule of thirds. So you've got that saving pot for those months where things go a bit to Pete Tong. And so suddenly I had a year where everything dropped. I also had a year where my income dropped quite considerably because I got ill. Mm -hmm. So suddenly my ability to earn, I had to cancel a tour. I had to cancel a whole set of things. And so therefore the um, my situation suddenly was changing quite dramatically. And because I was supposed to be away on tour, people weren't expecting me to be around. So therefore it was hard to reline work back up. So sometimes there's points in time where a life throws you a curveball and those incomes will, your incomes will drop. So you go, oh, I'm steady, steady, steady. And then I reckon it's like one in every six or one in every 10 years, you're just going to have a diabolical year. And that's yeah. just, just the way it goes. Um, it's a bit like the rule of, of like one in 10 applications is going to come back. I reckon it's the same in freelancing, <laughs> yeah. but there's just going to be a year where it just goes Pete Tong. And it's usually very little to do if you're set. You've not, it's not normally that you have done anything wrong. Uh, it will just be that a business goes under, a contract doesn't land, something shifts, you might have a half emergency. We might be in the middle of a national pandemic. You know, well, yeah. One of those things. <laughs> um, but they, it takes a lot of guts to see past that. And that's where one of the things weirdly about being self-employed and having your tax returns and having this accounting, you can see year on, year on, uh, as you start to build your career, you go, I am really quite stable at this place. If I want to transition mm. up another gear, I'm going to have to do something. But if I'm happy with being at this place, then I... I, I can see that that regularly happens. There was also something else we were talking about the other day, which I think is worth discussing as well, because I think it comes into this about the same way as there being every now and yet, again, there'll be a year where everything goes Pete Tong. Um, but there is also how things happen episodically. So you were saying that, you know, you might have be a person who influences, influences. You are an influencer, John, definitely. Every day. Um, Thanks so much. Invoices uh, on a weekly basis most of my self-employed work was episode, episodic. They would be a contract and they would be contracts every three or four months because of who I was working for or the commissions mm -hmm. we were doing. And so I knew that there'd be kind of like a glut coming into the, um, the business account and, and then it would taper down and then it would come back in. And so over the years, I became comfortable with that through flow through the company um, but it can be very uncomfortable. We were talking about the panic you have as a self-employed person, and I don't know any self-employed person who manages not to have this, which is over that Christmas period where for some reason it always feels like there's no work lined up for the next year and you're going to hit January and nobody's going to ever employ you. <laughs> I mean, th this is the first bit of paid work that I've had this year. And I have had, um, yeah, there's lots of interesting things. Like I've had chats with people and that, that, and that, that in itself is quite um interesting because chats are time and effectively your money uh but a lot of chats don't lead to work <laughs> and i know that slightly contradicts what i was saying about networking earlier but for instance uh throughout my freelancing people have approached me saying oh yeah we want to make this video and we want to talk to you about it like tell us how you think it could work and i've almost ended up doing well it has been effectively consultancy for them um because i've been like oh wait well, your things about this you should totally do it this way it should be this long you should maybe have a script that goes like this you could film it like that and giving them quite a lot of information and then it's gone completely dead 
and I've never heard from them again. Uh, and, and, and so that's kind of a, a time that I've spent doing that in the hope that it will lead to something and it hasn't. And I think, um, I think it's fair to say, and I, I don't know whether it's quite, I don't know whether it's, it's, a, it's dramatic to describe it like this, but it kind of goes back to the idea of resilience. Um, there's quite a lot of failure involved in freelancing. I think there's probably quite a lot of failure involved in all types of work, but because it's just you, it feels like, like big failure. And it feels like it's all on you as well, because who else could it be on? You're the only person working in your business. You can't blame your team. You can't blame it or what something else. Um, and, and I think like with what you were saying, it's about kind of understanding that things will improve again and there will be ebbs and flows over the year. Uh, it, January is always, always silence and no money coming in. And uh, interesting for me this year, I, I did quite a large uh, a quite a large job at the end of last year. I've only actually just now been able to invoice it because I've been waiting for them to get around to sending me the details to do it. Um, so that, and that today was the first invoice I'd sent since October, I think. Mm. And that was getting to be a bit worrying. <laughs> uh, and it was just kind of like this mythical amount of money that I knew I'd actually worked for and I knew should be coming to me at some point, but I hadn't even sent an invoice for it yet because I couldn't. And now I'm probably gonna have to wait another 30 days for it to arrive. And how am I going to kind of manage myself during this period? Um, uh, thankfully, I've got some money saved up to cope with that because I thought ahead. Um, but yeah, it's definitely um, it's definitely about um, there's definitely elements of bravery in there as well. But also the bravery to admit that things are going badly for you, mm -hmm. and that's that's when the importance of networks and having friends doing similar things or drastically different things to you is really useful because then you can kind of either be commiserating together and actually feel like a unit going through it which is always going to help sharing a problem or it may be that yeah you you strike up that conversation with somebody and then that actually leads to something the thing that yeah. is really going to help you yeah definitely and it's also worth saying that thinking about work across um different strands so I'm just thinking about the fact that you were saying, you know, you're you're doing light touch editing on um, Zoom webinars, masterclass mm. like these. Um, you're doing uh, work like this, which is participating and um, being a phenomenal panelist in a uh, <laughs> masterclass. <laughs> first, my pleasure. Um, and then your your photo shoots, which usually take about a day's worth of work, you know, versus a film shoot on something. It's often really worthwhile to think about having a um, a range of different things. I'd often think yeah. about uh, um, one day masterclasses about, you know, participating in workshops for other people or running workshops for people about the bigger commissions, the things that are leading into things, the building up stuff. So I'd normally try and think across about three different financial scales so that there was two or three things that bring you in just enough money a month. And then there's one thing that brings you in a top up over two, three months. And then there's one thing every four or five months that just makes everything way better. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and that was often quite a good way to, to help even out some of those um, peaks and troughs. As like I said, the commissions were often episodic. And I knew that that's how that worked and the, the work my company was generating, you know, um, or as you said, it's like how you, how you make sure you can ride those um, time scales. And actually, I think it's really important to try and address that. Um, I was just thinking about the that question about you saying that you sometimes ask people at the end of a project how much they've been paid on it. Um, mm. I think there's also something I'd like to ask you about, which is about project creep. I, I have certainly worked on projects where there's been a clear brief, we've agreed the number of days, we've agreed the day rate, so on and so forth. And as the project's crept on for kind of getting it over the line or they've changed their brief and in some very subtle but very definite ways, you know, it's maybe cost me another 15, 20 days of work. I have never managed to get somebody to find suddenly the extra budget for those 15, 20 days of work. Um, but what I have always made sure I've done is write a friendly 
uh, feedback at the end of it so that they have <laughs> yeah. that information going forward for the next person and go, we agreed this and these are these things. It may be useful for you to know that actually to deliver this project because this and this happened, it was these extra number of days. So you might want to and going forward. I mean, I will try and get the money out of them. It probably, or oh, I used to try and get the money out of them, but I used to usually set the main goal being that actually the next time that they proposed and framed a project or the next time somebody approached me about it, I had done the going over the numbers enough to know actually you, I needed, to, I even needed to push back and go, you're not budgeting enough days for this project. Um, or that, that that commissioner going forward was aware that actually that was unrealistic and they, they're going to need to um, rethink the budgets they put aside for projects like that in the future. I don't know whether you do, you've ever done similar or have you ever managed to claim back those days and things? I feel like I'm going to start throwing shade now. No, um, so I have, <laughs> I have two, two interesting examples that I thought of straight away. So the first one uh, was a few years ago where I kind of would just, I just started freelancing. So I was feeling, I was feeling good, but I wasn't feeling that confident. And I was commissioned to create a series of videos, let's say six videos. And um, I did so. And I was working with somebody to produce with the project to do that. And then uh, we created them, all looked great. And then they got sent to the person who was actually going to make the decision on them or not. <laughs> uh, bearing in mind that I'd actually used up all my time at that point, they came back saying, these aren't good enough. Uh, and then because of the nature of who it was, I really liked them and I, I wanted to work for them again. Um, I did the work didn't end up being that much more work, but it was still effectively being working for free. Um, and then I, um, I think, I, no, I was feeling confident because I think I did slyly make my feelings known, known about it. And then um, they couldn't find any more budget for me, but they did give me uh, a voucher, uh, which was better than nothing. Um, and then uh, interestingly, last year I had a, a similar thing as well, where I was assigned uh, a set number of days at a, um, it was actually a much lower day rate, but there was no work out there. So I went for it. I was like, I've got to do it. Um, and then we, the, the project ended up being way more intense than anybody could ever imagined. And so we were spending all week on it. We were only spending, meant to be spending a few days a week, ended up being all week, weekends, just to make this work because of, um, because of the nature of what it was, and it was kind of like live stuff, we were like, well, if we actually want it to work well on the day, we need to do this work to make it happen. There's no choice here. And I ended up working uh, quite, we all ended up quite working quite a lot longer than we were meant to. Um, and uh, I, some, I think it got to a, um, a kind of a, a team meeting further down the line towards the end when everyone was feeling a bit kind of grumpy about this. And then someone asked me to do an extra thing. And I was like, no <laughs> and I, yeah and I, well, I didn't say it like that I was like I feel like I'm going to push back on this because uh, I actually got to the end of my project time yesterday and so I know that I'm going to be doing this going forward and I will be doing those these kind of live days but I don't want to be doing any more time than I'm really than I really have to because I'm effectively working for free and also the work that I've been doing, I've actually been working at a day rate, which is half of what I would be normally. So respectfully, I'm not going to be doing that. I will help you find something else you can. So it was done in a very, very respectful way, um, but I was kind of quite clear about it. And then that's the first time they found some budget at the end of it for all of us to pay kind of an extra five yeah. extra days kind of thing. So yeah. um, what can you do? <laughs> yeah and I think sometimes, sometimes it isn't changeable at the time but I think the feeding yeah. back is really really vital the same way as you take stock and think through what worked what didn't work what could I learn better how many extra days was it um and know you have the confidence to constructively feed that back or to mm. push back but that sometimes it's not necessarily going to be able to change the financial situation um and I'm very glad to hear that it does I mean I certainly when we commission people now if people tell me it's ended up being extra days I will always try to find that extra money because I understand and appreciate where some of those project creeps come in and so I have learned the lesson myself as a commissioner to try and support that you're a good person Laura you're yes. a good person <laughs> some days, some days. Um, so I've just caught an eye of the time and I'm really aware that oh, you've yeah. had and um, no it's brilliant um the most it's this has just been absolutely extraordinary it was 
incredibly detailed, really open, really honest, everything which I love about the way you work and your approach to it. And um, and these, this conversation has been really, really rich. So I can't thank you enough. And I'm sure everyone on our uh, listening the other end will be to is in total agreement. I suppose I am going to ask you the classic provocation, which is if there was one uh, one thing you could say to everybody um, about uh, to, for them as their take home or to kind of hold or their spear to hold in the air, what would it be? Oh God. Um, okay, again, I haven't articulated this in my head properly, but I feel like the question, who is this for? is always a good one to ask about anything you're making, anything you're doing, and um, anything other people are doing as well. Because by asking yourself that, you're, you're kind of interrogating whether this is beneficial for you is it beneficial for you financially, creatively, in terms of your future? Uh, is what somebody else is doing, is it for them? Is it for, uh, is it, is it for bad reasons? Is it for good reasons? Is it for good reasons that you agree with? Uh, is it for tricky reasons that you haven't quite made your mind up about, but you know inside, deep down, you completely agree with and you need some help articulating that? Um, yeah, really think about everything you're doing um, right down to how strict you are about your practice, about your bookkeeping, right? You're doing it for HMRC, but also you're doing it for you, right? You're doing it for your peace of mind. Um, I, I do it so I don't get anxiety. Ironically, because I do my uh, tax return in about June, by the time it gets to uh, January, I keep forgetting that I've done it. So I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, I need to do it. I need to do it. And I get that. But like, I, I do it so I don't get that. Um, and that kind of extends to the way that I work as well, down to kind of, I'm really making uh, a big effort to try and change the way that, not change, but to make the, work, the way I work inclusive in, in as many different ways as possible. Um, and also um, just a nice thing to be doing because I feel like we all wanna be doing creative things and it's really nice to get paid for that as well. Um, so yeah, who's it for? Keep asking yourself that. That's absolutely brilliant. Uh, well, John, I, can, I can't thank you enough for making the time this evening. And I, we're really lucky to uh, get to um, hear your wisdom and your thoughts and to, for people to get to hear about your journey. Because I, uh, and I can't recommend John highly enough to you if you're looking for a photographer, <laughs> filmmaker or an editor over this next year. Yeah, um, <laughs> uh, uh, come to John. And when this goes up online onto the Beehive um, channel, you'll be able to find his contact details. Um, so that's uh, everything from us tonight. Uh, next week's talk on the 21st, because today is the 14th. Next week's talk on the 21st um, is going to be equally brilliant, um, but in a completely different way. We've got Benny Lau Crispin and Maddie V um, doing a session from the Granary Studio just outside of Plymouth. This is a brilliant new vocal uh, um, music recording studio. Maddie is an amazing drum and bass MC and rapper, and uh, Benny is a commercial music producer, and they're going to be doing a co-hosted um, a piece about uh, uh, why, how you make a career in the music industry and how you make a career in the Southwest. How do you hold on to not getting sucked into London? Um, and mm. so I think that's going to be a really great session. And believe me, Maddie is, Maddie V is amazing. Um, so yes, that's us. Uh, that's all from us here tonight. Um, thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you next week. <laughs>